Nobody's heckling now. <laughs> in Hebrew, you want some Hebrew, don't you? In Hebrew, the book is called Zechariah, meaning Yahweh remembers. God remembers. Zechariah was a Levite who was born in Babylon. You can chase it through Nehemiah 12. He was a son of Be Berechiah, the grandson of Iddo, the priest. I can give you lots of references later if you so wish. He's got a common name, but of course he's a priest. He's from a priestly family. But he was also a prophet, because Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1, God calls him to be a prophet. You'll come across Haggai in your readings of the Old Testament. This man is a contemporary of Haggai, the prophet. Zerubbabel was the leader of the Jews who'd come back to rebuild Jerusalem. Joshua was the high priest at the time. Unlike Haggai, he was an older man. Zechariah was probably a young man when he prophesied. You can see that in Zechariah 2 and 4. And his ministry ran with a fair degree of certainty from 520 BC to 518 BC. Probably on from there because he was a younger man. But certainly we know about that 520 to 518 period. So the surrounding history ran something like this. This is the circumstance, this is the situation to which he prophesied. He prophesied during the first return from Babylonian exile. The people of God had sinned, they'd been carried away in captivity. In 538 BC, Cyrus was king of Persia. Cyrus said, you can go back. Haggai and Zechariah probably came back at the beginning of that return. Haggai and Zechariah prophesied, and the temple was completed under Darius, so 521 to 486. We started the, the offerings and sacrifices at the temple, the Levitical stuff that he'd known all about. The foundation for the temple was laid. And then there was this resistance. Samaritan and Persian resistance ended the rebuilding of the temple for 15 years until 520 BC. Remember, Zechariah and Haggai prophesied from 520 when it began again through to 518. They're encouraging the people with this impossible task, with all this opposition, in all this weakness, with this terrible lack of resources, and being so few people. Zechariah is prophesying into that as the young man speaking for God. He was there at the beginning of things. It was a small looking but amazingly significant start. It just didn't look like it. And he was God's means for telling people God is in this. God is at work here. It looks small, it looks strong, it looks pathetic. But it's got God behind it. Go on. Go on. You'll read the book and you think, what? <laughs> What's all this? <clears throat> it's called apocalyptic literature. And it's full of symbols and pictures and stuff like that. Characterized by symbolic visions, animal symbols, symbolic numbers, two, four, seven, a blending of history and imagery. That's what it looks like. But what's apocalyptic literature for? From this point, from Daniel, right the way through to Revelation, which is really developed apocalyptic literature. What it's for is to offer hope to a downcast people through describing the ultimate defeat of evil and the victory of God. Somebody summarised, in the title of a book on, on Revelation, somebody summarised the message of the book of Revelation like this, in three words. The Lamb wins. How about that? It's terrific, isn't it? The Lamb wins. We get up and wet. Sunday morning in Landelo. <laughs> it's okay, the land wins. And you come in here, there's a few of us, perhaps some Sundays there's only a few of us, and uh, the land wins. And people come in and out of our meeting room and whatever. And, you know, you love them to death, that's all you can do. That's what we're here to do. Do you know what's going to happen? The land's going to win. In some ways, apocalyptic literature is like parables. It, it's meant to reveal and to hide truth. And, and that's what's going on in Ezekiel, definitely. That's what's going on to some ex large extent in Daniel. That's going on to an extreme extent in, Re in Revelation as the people of God are under persecution. 
point of it all is this. The book is saying this. This is the shape of it. There's an opening exhortation. Chapter 1, 2 to 6. And then there are these eight prophetic dream visions for this purpose, in this mode, in this style. From 1, 7 to 6, 8. Then there are the historical messages that are kind of not too explicit, because they can't be. Chapters 7 to 8. And then two prophetic oracles at the end, chapters 9 through 14. What we're looking at is right there in the middle of those eight prophetic dream visions. We're looking at chapter 4. Chapter 4. Demonstrating, in, introducing glimpses of reality, of the, the situation they're in for this return small, little short of resources, lacking everything people. Showing them their situation actually from a heavenly standpoint. Not from the one they see with their two eyes every day. Showing them and telling them, you're not as pointless as alone, and alone as you feel. Demonstrating the Lord is going to establish his kingdom. Not through a gradually evolutionary process, but through struggle and tension. And urging God's people to return to him and rely on him. And he'll continue to return to them and continue to fulfill his word. To promise that in spite of his nation's lowly position, its spiritual insensitivity, a deliverer will bring a time of ultimate blessing and there at a crucial stage in that work. So our passage sits there in the middle of that section of visions, telling them not to despise what looks like a day of small things. So let's read it. Three slides. Last one's a short one. <coughs> Harris is going to do the short one. Callum, what are you going to do? Um, the short one. <laughs> I do half of these. Okay. Go on in. What are you going to read, Callum? Um, Share that one with Mike. Um, is that right? Where, yeah. where do I need to? We need one more volunteer in the middle. Just thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Crack on. Nice and low. <laughs> then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awoken from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand lamp with a bowl at the top and seven lamps in it with seven candles to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one of the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the lord to Zerubbabel, Not, my, not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Thanks, guys. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the, Lord of, the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hands of Sarah Bubble? Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, What are those two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? Excellent. He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. How weird does that feel? I can see as you were reading, you're thinking, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, what? Well, let's do a drawing. Can you see the picture on the wall? you put the picture up? You're glad I've got the picture up. Pictures are great. Whatever we do in service, we draw your picture. We're trying to paint pictures with words or something. Glad I'm Glad I'm I'll talk back then. I feel old already. Let's be absolutely clear, because we need to be. It's not complicated. Trust me for a minute. 
or ten. <laughs> There's this branched candlestick, this branched, seven branched, light bearing candlestick. We spoke of one a little while ago, can you remember? Hold, hold on to that thought. Then there's two olive trees and there's two pipes carrying oil to the trees and seven channels carrying oil to every one of the lamps from this big old bowl. So you've got a big old bowl, you've got this light bearing seven branch candlestick and you've got these two trees, olive trees. And the oil that somehow feeds and supplies them is supplied to each element in each of these things. Happy so far? No! But you've got the picture in your head. We're going to get there. It's simple. We said that this book, this part of this book, is heavy on the old apocalyptic imagery, right? And that imagery, those symbols are there to kick off things in people's heads that they would be associated with. It's a very, very postmodern thing, although it's 518, 520 BC. Because nowadays, if I go and speak at a student thing, I don't have a nice, well-worked-out, uh, logical, linear, analytical approach, the way I do for you people. I have to sort of kick things off like I'm talking from a Pinterest board. Right? There are pictures and images, and you tell them a gobbit at a time like that, and it's not all linked, because they get confused by that. Their mind's different, they've grown up on Xbox, and it's different. Zachariah is a prophet for our times. Because he's got these things he lobs at you, and you know, oh, I know what it's about, I know what that's about, I know what it's about, but you don't, because you're not from that period of history, 5th century BC, ancient Near East. Those symbols, they count for something, it's like a token of meaning, it refers to something. Firstly, let's unpack the symbolism, firstly, this is a seven-stemmed lamp stand. You've been in the Bible a while. What's the number seven for? No, that's twelve. But that's the sort of idea. Seven, across scripture, is the number of wholeness and completeness. Okay? That's the way it is. Don't ask me why that is, but it was. Maybe there was somebody invented the counting system and he only had seven fingers. I have no idea. But, Seven days of the week, sweetie. Well, perhaps they had seven days of the week then, did they? Well, six days and then seven. Well, if they were Jewish, yes, that would have been absolutely correct, yeah. yeah. Seven is the number of completeness. A lampstand is the carrier of light. Now, I know that there are people out there, you can go and entertain yourself all afternoon if you want on Google, but people who want to go on beyond all of this into all sorts of speculation, imaginative interpretation, right? The opportunity of violence. I've got no idea why that entertains anybody. The thing is, those lamps, like the menorah at the temple, which came to be such a major part of the festival of lights, do you remember that? Needed supplying with oil. They're rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding, they're reinstituting the furniture. They're putting the menorah back in the temple, the way the Torah told them to do. It is the big light-bearing jobby in the temple. Here's the way that God's light shines out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. The whole, complete, light shiningness. Notice this is the complete light-bearing setup. Then along with the complete light-bearing edifice comes two olive trees. Because hmm? <laughs> you'll notice the olive isn't flowing from the olive trees into the lamp. It's flowing from the bowl into the olive trees. So all about. Now of course olive trees are famously long lived. There are eight famous olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem that are at least as old as when Jesus was there. Oldest known olive trees in Israel are about 3,000 years old. Long standing perpetuating themselves across time. But also they are famously fruitful. Famously fruitful. Psalm 128 verse 3, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Thank you very much. 
They're not going to leave home at all, they must send it. it. Olive oil, used extensively in biblical times. What was olive oil used for in biblical times? Callum? Uh, did they use it to light lamps? Oh, yes, they did. Okay. They used it to light lamps, and they used it to... Cook. Yeah, I knew you'd cover that. I suppose, yeah, they must have used it to cook. And to make food, bread. To feed themselves, to make bread, to feed themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Fantastic. They used it for anointing. And why did they anoint? They anointed people in particular. They anointed prophets, priests and kings. As a symbol that the Spirit of God was now coming on that person for a particular role and function in the purposes of God. You know the word Messiah that's used of Jesus? You know what it means? Hamashiach. It means the anointed one. The one on whom the Spirit comes. You know, par, par excellence. It's all about the empowerment of God on individuals so that they can serve Him, so that they can fulfill His purposes, whatever those might be. And in this case, it's an empowerment of both of the covenant peoples and of the full complement of those who are called to carry His light. Both covenant peoples, two trees called to bear fruit for God. The old covenant people of God and the new covenant people of God are there. What are they for? They're to bear fruit for God in the world. And one worked really well, the other is working slowly. Um, but do you see what I mean? And here's the anointing of God flowing from his bowl to enable those people to bear fruit. And the completeness of his people, all that who are his people, to bear light from him. Their fruit to God through their human experience and radiate the light as people see his truth written in human life in the world in which he sent us. Are you with me so far? It's straightforward, isn't it? It's very straightforward to bear some of the right, I can tell you. It's perfectly straightforward. Are you with me so far? Because now Zechariah asks the angel what this means. And he gets back from the angel a clear answer. And it's more to do with the channels and the pipes than it is with where the stuff flows to. Listen. Zechariah asks the angel, what does this mean? And here comes the answer. Bear in mind, this is an answer given to a small, weak-feeling bunch of returned exiles whose resources must have seemed thoroughly inadequate to the task and who had enemies on every hand. Incidentally, notice the interpretation doesn't go into immense detail, tracking through obscure corners of the Old Testament to come up with something elaborate and complex. It's really pretty straightforward. Here's the heart of what God says he's conveying through this. I asked the angel who talked with me, chapter 4, verse 6, What are these, my Lord? What's this pair of bushes and this funny candlestick and bowl and oil? Do you not know, he answered me? Do you, he answered me, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So here is, in linear analytical propositional form, the truth that this picture is supposed to convey. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The point is not the bushes, the point is not the candlestick, the point is the pipes and the channels. What you achieve for me, the way you bear fruit for me, the way you shine your light for me in this world, my light for me in this world, is, is, is not by might. It's not by power. It's by those pipes and channels by my spirit, bringing my blessing. When we feel very weak, when our resources seem strained and inadequate, the temptation to try and find some strength of our own and rely on what we can do can be extremely strong. That's when we need to be as vulnerable as the guy in the meeting. Not by my might, nor by power. These won't do it. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. Just tell that to Zerubbabel as he struggles to carry out his God-given load of responsibility. 
What he started, the Spirit of God will empower him to continue, enable him to complete. And the oil has just got to keep flowing to the point of delivery and effectiveness. And then there'll be light, and then there'll be fruit. Keep that oil flowing. It's the pipes and the channels. Trees that bear fruit are those who are anointed to serve God and bring oil and serve God. <clears throat> so there's your Old Testament and New Testament new covenant people of God. They must depend for their calling on no human might, no human power, but the supply of oil, the supply of anointing, and the Spirit of God poured out on them for all they need. <clears throat> the all-sufficiency of our God is not to be written about, debated, stroked, or admired. All sufficiency of our God is to be lived on. So in a sense I can't speak to that second heading. Because you're going to do that tomorrow. Today. You're going to be learning its message for today. You're going to be doing that. Today, tomorrow, what's tomorrow going to bring? Pipes and channels, hopefully. And it's on the heart. In the bowl. Mike is now going to give us another bit of imagery. <laughs> Just thought I thought I'd cut it clear. Go on, mate. Yeah. Risk it. Heart being God. Well, not God, but being basically Jesus. The outpouring of the Spirit of God is in that bowl, yeah. see? The outpouring of the Spirit of God comes yeah. from that bowl. And we're not going to get to God the vein if you put it into human terms. And if those pipes are blocked yeah. through not looking after yourself or not looking at the word or if you've got blockage there, then you're not going to get from the heart to God. It's a relationship, isn't it? Yeah. So staying looking after yourself, you mean just looking after yourself in terms of your relationship with him? Yes. Like so you've got to make sure your relationship is... Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because in that relationship, then yeah. the blessing of God flows, the Spirit of God flows in. in. There's something else you've got to say. Let me put it like this, because this is important. Um, Mark Driscoll, okay? A uh, big church in America, was he called? I uh, forget. Brain of it today. He's got this big thing, he's very masculine, all big on the old masculinity thing, you know, or a certain approach to it, <clears throat> I'd say. He says, you know, guys are like trucks. They run better with a load. Um, very kind of sense. You, can, you know, you see these good old American boys signing up to that one, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, ladies are completely left out of it. Um, ladies, it's true of you as well. You also are like trucks. Um, <laughs> we're all like trucks. We all run better with a load, in, in, in this sense. Only when, yes, there's a load, but only when in truthful, realistic, human openness and vulnerability these hard experiences of life take us, male and female, back to the channel, back to the pipe, back up to the bowl for the constant flow of the anointing of God and His Spirit which drives our light bearing and our fruitfulness for Him in that experience. Yeah? Now I think if you and I continued the discussion we've just been having in John chapter 15, then it start making more sense, because that's where Jesus says, I'm the vine, we are the branches. Unless someone remains in me, mm -hmm. remain in me, you bear much fruit. Making sense? In many ways it seems to me Zechariah 4 is an early John 15, in the way it works out for us. Because the important thing is not what it's so easy to get carried away with, the, the, the bowl, or oh, the trees, or oh, the funny hands there. The pipe and the channel. Not by might, nor by power, but in vulnerability and dependence on my spirit, says the Lord. I'll tell you something. We have the conversation. You must have seen quite a change in our discussion over the evening. Was it about six o'clock last night? 
Um, I had no sermon for today. I was well, worn out, washed out, uh, lacking strength, and uh, we were talking about how on earth we were going to do today. Yeah? And you kind of phoned me back to say, look, don't worry, don't worry, they're really looking after me. We don't have to do anything, we don't mind, they're great. Um, you look to the pipe and you look to the channel. And God supplies something, which might be of some use, you never know. Thanks for your patience.